I want you to turn with me today in the Word of God to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 4. Glory to God. And like I said today, it's good to have more than one voice screaming out. Not just Tim Halcom on the, from the worship team. <clears throat> um, chapter 4. Uh, there's some things about resting in God. Resting in God's goodness that I want to share about. Resting in God. There's a lot of anxiety. Now, today, well, in the middle of the night, I don't know how many times I looked at the clock. I was so excited about getting here today. Anybody excited about getting here? One person told me this morning, so I thought I was going to get a speed ticket away church this morning. Not because I was running late. It's just I wanted to get there. Uh, so I just kept looking at the clock, looking at the clock, stayed in bed as long as I could, and uh, ended up getting up and uh, arriving here about 6.30 this morning. Uh, I just had this... this uh, this nervous excitement. It's not a bad nervous, like I was nervous. Just this, this excitement inside of me, ready to go, ready to, uh, to have a good time in the Lord and, and to believe God. Folks, this has been, I know it's been challenging for you, but it's challenging for us uh, to uh, this gift of God inside of you that you want to put out. You know, you're created to preach the gospel, to look at people, to lay hands on the sick and and, uh, and you know, you, you feel like where, where are people at uncomfortable by anointing with oil and laid hands. These are biblical things that I don't want the enemy to ever mess with. I want us to be able to always uh, see these things done in the name of the Lord. I mentioned today in church, there are certain sounds that ought to be made. You ought to hear the sound of people worshiping together. You ought to hear the sounds of people crying. Uh, crying is a sound that you ought to hear in church. You ought to hear the sounds of intercession in church. You, you ought to hear the sounds of fellowship in the church. You know, the, these are sounds that, that please God. The only sound that doesn't please God is snoring in church. Uh, so uh, that's a sound that we can eliminate. But anyway, there's certain things that ought to be found in the house of God. Certain things ought to be found in the house of God. And so uh, there's some verses on my heart. Uh, I had some things in here, you know, to mention some things about Mother's Day. But I think Eugene and Allie uh, in that video did a very good Mother's Day presentation. Amen. Let's give them another hand. <clears throat> so uh, uh, they preached a good Mother's Day's message. Amen. Just don't put your dirty socks in your sister's pillowcase. I mean, besides that, uh, since he has no feet, I don't know where he got dirty socks at. Uh, but anyway, somebody asked me that going out the door and said, but he said he had no feet. Where did he get his dirty socks? <laughs> so anyway, uh, people listen. People listen. People pay attention. I remember dad said one time, uh, dad said, uh, he was preaching, and he was wondering if people's paying attention. You know, I felt the same way at times. Uh, not today, though. Glory to God. People are locked in. Uh, but he was preaching one day, standing right here, and he says, uh, and there's a frog in the baptistry. And he just kept preaching, and uh, nobody said anything. And one little kid came up and said, Pastor, can I see your frog in the baptistry? Nobody else got it. Nobody else said anything to him. One person wanted to see the frog. So it makes you wonder, who really listens, you know? Uh, but uh, it's like I was impressed with Shannon. Scott and I was impressed with Shannon. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, because it's not really visible, from this corner all the way around the back wall of this corner, it's all newly painted. That's a light gray on the walls there. And uh, we're trying to update this, and everything was newly painted. And so those shelves in the back where we were going, where used to be speakers, uh, we said we're going to take those down. And Shannon said, I think that one's got a time capsule. I said, a time capsule? I said, I never heard that. He says, yeah. Uh, Pastor Rothwell was preaching one day, and he says, there's a time capsule on that. Was I called Dad? He said, I don't remember that. And so they took it down, and so we took it down, and there was a thing in there. And I said, Shannon, how in the world did you? So Shannon listened that day. I think, I'm so thankful that he listened, and he found it. <laughs> They had some hours, how many people worked to put the system in and, and who labored here. And they had a, a, a tape of uh, Dr. Charles Rothwell and a bulletin and had some things like that. But no one knew it, you know. And, and so uh, Miss Shannon remembered. So at least one person hears what's going on. I think we're going to beat the record today. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, I want to start at verse 9. You know, it's, uh, I don't like starting at verse 9. I'd rather start at chapter 1, verse 1. 
but uh, we may not have time to get to verse 9 of chapter 4 if we do. But verse 9, it said, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. That is such a big statement. There remains a rest for the people of God. You know, have you noticed people are tense lately? People are tense. Did you notice how people acted over this toilet paper thing? I mean, uh, there was fights in the store. People fighting over stuff like that. Uh, Janine was telling me one day that her son Christopher was at a store waiting to buy a can of Lysol. And said that the guy was stocking it, but he, he said, I'd like to have one. He says, no, you can't do it until I'm done. Until I'm done. And said, so he stocked the shelf. And before Christopher got up, some lady came with a cart and took her arm and threw them all in her cart and walked away. He said, hey, I'm getting one of those. And so people, people are tense. And I wonder, you know, the world's tense, but Christians ought to be a little more at peace. It didn't say unwise. I said at peace. Because we really believe in our life, God has his hand upon it. That God has things in control in our life. Now, I can't say God's got everything in control in the White House. I, I can't say God's got everything in control in everyone else's house. But as a believer that walks with God, God's got jurisdiction in your life, and God is moving in your life. Even when you can't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. It doesn't matter what's going on, God is working. The good news is, stay at peace. We've been talking about how to be led by the Spirit of God, how to be led by that inner peace. You have got to remain in peace. And I realize there's a lot of anxiety. I've been preaching it for the last several years. Last year was one of our theme scriptures. Though darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon us. And it goes on to say, and the Gentiles or the heathen will come running to the light. But if the, if the church looks like the world and acts like the world, they, they won't know who to go running to. Folks, it's time that people run to the light. Amen. And it's not like when someone dies, and I've heard nurses said they've told people, you know, that are dying, go to the light. But the truth is, people are coming out of darkness and into light. They're running to the light. Amen. So there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his works. So God created the heavens and the earth and all of this in six days, and he ceased from his work on the seventh day. So what, it's, what, I, what I'm going to... What I'm going to get out of this is that we do not have to do this thing in the flesh. God is there. God's going to help us. We don't have to spend our life toiling. We don't have to spend our life wrestling with this. God has given us the promise, and we know that we can come out of this. Amen? I realize pressure is real. I realize that attacks are real. I realize fear is a real spirit. Dread is a real spirit. Uh, these spirits try to come in, they try to attack, they try to steal, kill, and destroy. And we have an obligation to set a guard over this. But if you don't have a guard or have a place where you're going to set it, it's almost like every other pew is blocked off. Now, what happens is that they said this is a standard that we once set. So, we, you know, we obligated by what's going on there. Uh, and so th these pews, or people are not entering. So when the enemy comes your way, you're going to, have to say, there's distance between me and you, man. You are not approaching. You're not going to encroach on the distance. This is between me and God right here. There's no encroachment into my area. Amen. You stand free. We, there's a guy that I knew that I, when I met Angel, where they went to church at, uh, I, 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 he, uh, he was a uh, close talker. You know, I mean, when he talked, he liked to be real close to you. I mean, real close, almost like nose to nose, close. And, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, you, you just kind of want to go back, but then he walks right for you, you know. And he just likes that. He likes that, that, that personal, that up close and, and personal, you know. Uh, but some, sometimes there's got to be a little distance in there, you know. Uh, just like, this is my space. This is my space. I, I see you brush your teeth today, but this is still my space. <laughs> this is still my space. But, you know, you got to remind the devil, this is my space. You're, this is off limits to you. My house is off limits to you. This is my space. This is where God reigns. Fear, this is off limits to you. Dread, this is off limits. This is my space. There's not even a social distance. Matter of fact, you flee. Amen. Amen. you got to be able to have this. you got to be able to have it. 
Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent, be diligent, be diligent. We were talking about this so many times. There's a reward to the diligent. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. The, those who disobeyed, and I mentioned, referred to it, and you can write it down and read it later. Psalm 78 talks about how God blessed the children of Israel, provided for them, and how they still walked away from God and rejected God. They still walked away and rejected God, but God kept providing. God's such a merciful God. He's such a good God. And uh, matter of fact, it says that when they wanted meat, he provided meat. When they needed water, he provided water. Not just for them, but enough for their whole animals. Can you imagine almost 3 million people plus their livestock and out of a rock? God provided water to feed them and all their stock. God is a faithful God. But the Bible says even while the meat was still in their mouth, while the meat, before they could reach their toothpick, while the meat was still in their mouth, they began to plain against God. They began to come against God. They began to question God. And they started saying, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? After God did all of this stuff, can God do this? Well, you know, the truth is, uh, we must be diligent and we must not follow after the pattern of those who went before us. But knowing that God is God and he's going to be the provider. And I don't have to live in turmoil, fear, or any dread or anything else. For the word of God, verse 12, this is what it is. For the word of God is alive, it's quick, it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division or dividing of soul and spirit, and joint and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. So God's word is what's going to separate. You know, God's word is a separator. It's a divider. God's word will separate truth. He will separate light from darkness. Matter of fact, God's word has a sanctifying power to it. You know, sanctification is something that people you say all the time. Thank God I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, but uh, sanctification is a process. It happens all the time. It's a continual thing. Every day, God is wanting to bring us out of something and bring us into something better. That's what God does. So the word sanctified is separating. Uh, that's why I tell people, if you just get saved, you know, I shared this morning, my brother, uh, about, you know, two, almost two weeks now, got Got born again. You know, some people thought he'll never get born again. But uh, they're not God, are they? Uh, but he got born again. And I mean, he got born again. Uh, I tell people, I watched him. Somebody stood still the other day and he started preaching to him. And, uh, but he got born again. But the point is, he's a baby. Amen. Thank you. Uh, he's a baby. He's a baby. You know what babies do? They mess themselves. Babies make mistakes. That's, that's, what, that's what happened. That's what happens. And so uh, he doesn't, uh, you don't expect people to live like you, but what God's doing every day, separating things from his life in his own way, in his own fashion. And even at the age we are spiritually, not the age physically, but spiritually, God separates things from our life. Matter of fact, in the book of John, uh, Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy root. Sanctify them through thy word. The word sanctifies. John 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. For thy word is truth. Then he says, and think of verse 19 of that chapter. For their sake. For their sake I sanctify myself. Well, there was no sin for him to be sanctified from. We'll read that in a minute. But what he said, for their sake, I separated myself. I kept myself separate so I could be the example and be the, and be the sacrifice that is pure. For their sakes, I sanctified myself. Folks, the word of God, the truth of God's word is what sanctify. Sanctify them through thy truth. The word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder spirit and soul. And the time that we're living in right now with everything caving in on us, the only dividing power we have is God's truth, God's word. And if you listen to everything else going on, everything's going to start sounding echoey and you're not going to know what's going on. But the truth of God's word is still got to be the dividing factor in our life. Amen. It's got to be the dividing factor. God's word is truth. It doesn't matter. It, it's, not, it's not a fact. It's truth. See, there's a difference. Now, that's why I said you can preach the same message, but you can't come out the same way. So if you're still streaming from this morning, add to it. Uh, God's word, you know, it, you can't, it's truth. It's not just fact. 
Facts are something that, uh, that is real. People said it's a fact that this person is dying of cancer. It's a fact that uh, they've lost everything. It's a fact. We got proof. The lawyer said it's there. It's a fact. Well, okay. I'm not denying the facts. But the truth is God has the ability to change it all. The fact is the doctor said there's no help for you. There's no treatment for you. You're dying. That may be a fact. But the truth is Jesus is still healer. And truth is able to separate you from facts. Truth is able to separate you from all of this turmoil. Truth is able to separate you from struggle. And for us to enter into God's rest, for us to enter into God's promise, so that we're, we don't fall after those who in the wilderness who went before us, for us to be separated that, we must stay in the truth. You know, uh, last night, Angel and I were sitting there, and we just put on gospel teaching. And, and uh, the truth is, you'll find yourself looking at Facebook and reading all that stuff, and before you know, you're just half ticked off. I mean, you are. You, I mean, you're just in the. You're just anybody besides us has read that stuff and let it affect you. I mean, it just affects you. It just just aggravates you. Just, ugh. I was watching a news report the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago. Big reports is coming out, and um, and by the time I got done, I wanted to throw my phone through the television. And I'm thinking, can you can you believe this? Because all that stuff messes with you. So you, what you got to do? You got to go back to the truth. You got to replace all of that back with the truth. You got to replace it with the truth. You got to replace it with truth. You got to replace it with truth because it's the truth of God's word that makes us free. It's the truth of God's word that makes alive inside of us. It's sharp, it's powerful, it's quicker. It, it's what brings us to a place of victory. And uh, God knows where we're at right now. Uh, just say to yourself, He knows where I am, He knows where I'm at. He knows where I at, where I'm at. Verse 14, let's skip 13, go to 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. What kind of high priest? Great. Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, our confession. Let us hold fast. For, for we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched or sympathized or compassionate with our weaknesses. But was in all points, in all points, in all places, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice he didn't say that we may find mercy to help. He said that we may find grace to help in a time of need. Now, mercy and grace are different. Mercy is when you know you messed up and, and you're out on the outer edge and, and you need you just need help. Or like I've said many times, mercy is when you know you've messed up and you deserve to be whipped and the one who deserves to whip you legally right hugs your neck instead and says, I forgive you. That's mercy. That's mercy. You know, uh, George Gatche shared some of the testimony here with some with the church years ago, when, uh, when we were buying the land that we're on right now, I'll, I'll show you what words will do. And uh, he shared this, and I'll give you a little more detail of it <clears throat> in case people miss what he says. Uh, there was a time when we did this. I kept saying, George, make sure that this paperwork is right. Make sure it's right. And to the best you can in that country, he did the best he could to make sure it was right. And so we had that two acres or so of land there and starting to build up on it. And uh, when I would call him, uh, he, he didn't seem right on the phone. Like he wasn't Jolly George as, uh, as he usually was. And, and uh, I said, uh, son, I'll tell you what. Uh, there's one thing I know. God is faithful. He says, uh, do you believe God wants you to, uh, to tell me that today? I said, I do. God is faithful. What I didn't know is somebody else came into the registrar's office and they they also had the number for that land and they said they also had the deed to that land and they said it was theirs and all that done all that we have done said we no longer have possession of it and you know you've heard the cases all the court cases we went through hiring lawyers and all of that and how God brought us out but Mary told me that he was so discouraged 
church. He said he wouldn't eat. He met with his church, and he says, I believe I'm done. I believe, I believe my ministry is over. There's no way I can face that. There's no way. I believe it's time for me to move on. There's no way out. And matter of fact, she told me, she says, he was so down. She said, I was concerned if he would live or not. That was her words, if he would even live or not. And uh, when I made my trip over there, he never told me on the phone. And when I got there, they sat me down and talked to me. And uh, come, come here, Don. Uh, George is, you know, about my height. And, and so George is telling me this. I could see. I mean, he's, he's pale. He's weak. And I was on this side of him. And I took my right hand and put it around him. And I looked at him and I said, son, listen to me. I find no fault in you. I find no fault in you. And when I did that, he just wept. He broke. And those words set him free. See, when you mess up, the enemy says fault, guilt, shame. But God says, I find no fault in you. See, love beat that. In his eyes, I had the right to drop the bomb. But mercy and love filled my heart and said, I have find no fault in you. He's not the, he, he said, he, he didn't say that, that you may find mercy to help in a time of need. He says, you might find grace. You might find grace because Jesus satisfied it all. He satisfied it all. Jesus did not leave anything to chance. And so grace is God's help, help from heaven. And so if you come boldly to the throne of grace, you'll find help from heaven in the time of need. You'll find help. This is an area that we don't have to cry out for mercy. This is us approaching God with boldness by grace. By grace. Amen. There's times I needed mercy. I prayed mercy on people. There's times I knew I was wrong. And I said, God, have mercy on me. I deserve that penalty. But have mercy. But when I want to approach God with boldness, I approach God knowing that Jesus paid the price and that I can find grace to help, heaven's help, help from heaven in a time of need. And uh, so we have that. So we can come boldly to the throne of grace, find, find that, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a t- time of need. So we obtained this so that my mercy came out and said, you're forgiven. I find no help in you. I find no no uh, fault in you. And just that love delivered him. Just that love d- delivered him. And then we had help from heaven. Help from heaven. We had help from heaven come after that. Help came from heaven. Matter of fact, $50,000 got erased on that land. $50,000. But we went through torment. We went through court costs. We went through, we went through this. That you may obtain mercy and find grace to help. In a time of need. Notice, it's not just mercy. It's grace in this thing. It's heaven's help. Jesus paid the price. He satisfied the penalty of sin. He satisfied. People say, God's mad. No, no, he's not. Jesus satisfied that. Jesus paid the price for that. So don't, don't walk around thinking God's angry at you. Jesus paid the price. He satisfied it. God is angry. At this. No, Jesus paid the price. God's already established what he's going to do. His word's clear what it is. Amen. So we come boldly to the, to, to the throne of what? The throne of grace. It's called the throne of grace. We may obtain mercy because we didn't deserve it. But we may obtain mercy because that's not what we deserve. But we'll find that grace because it's called what? A throne of grace. We, it's not a throne of disappointment. It's not a throne of shame. It's not a throne of fear. It's a throne of what? Grace. That you may obtain mercy and find grace. Grace in a time of need. And so when I looked at George, I know he was fearful to tell me. I know she told me he didn't want to tell you. But there was no judgment came at him. Zero. I I couldn't. it 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 wasn't like I tried to suppress it. It was love. What are you concerned about how to get out of it? At that time, I didn't know what was going to take. But at that time, you know what came out? Love. I looked at him. I find no fault in you. And then I obtained 
then he obtained grace. I obtained grace. We all obtain grace. So I approach the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help me in a time of need. Amen. So you attain mercy. Do you know what mercy is? Love. That's what it is. Love. When you mess up and you know somebody deserves to get you and they still love you, that's love. That's love. Now, there's actual mercy that's maybe not love when the, when the police pulls you over and they let you go. They don't have any love in their heart. It's just God shows up supernaturally to help you out. Uh, I've been there. Twice, three times. It's not my fault. It was a friend's fault. No. But anyway, so we're going to obtain mercy. So what you got to do is rest. Say rest. You've got to rest in God. Amen. So, yeah, but you don't know how bad I've messed up. Well, mercy, love's going to be drawn to you. But you're still going to have, it's still going to be a throne of grace to you. And you're going to obtain grace. You're going to obtain grace. It's still a throne of grace. And that's what I want people to understand. Through all of this, we still, God is still a merciful God and is still a throne of grace. He's still a merciful God and is still a throne of grace. Amen. Heaven's help. God, I thank God. I thank Him for heaven's help. I th- even when I live, even when everything is living right, I can't do it on my own. It takes heaven's help to get this done. It takes heaven's help. Amen. So, uh, say, thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. Amen. So, uh, we obtain mercy and still find grace. God never leaves you out. He never leaves you out. Go with me to the book of Mark. Yeah, the book of Mark, chapter 6. Book of Mark, chapter 6. I tried to share that with someone one day that, you know, you're approaching God in fear. It's not, it's not a throne of mercy where you got to beg. It's a throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. You know, I, have anybody ever been in a begging mode with God? Please, God, please, God, forgive me, God, please, God, forgive me. You know how easy that is to get out of that? Father, forgive me. It's that easy. I remember the day that it came a realization to me. We all we we'll claim and quote John 1 9. John, 1 John 1 9. Not St. John, 1 John. If I sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. He'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's, if, if I ask, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and what? Just. To forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And what I came to realization was, 1 John 1, 9 doesn't always bring a feeling. He didn't promise me a feeling, but what did he promise me? Forgiveness. He didn't promise me a feeling, he promised me forgiveness. Amen? If it was a throne of judgment, then we'd never have a chance. I just keep, this is in my heart so strong. If it's a throne of judgment, we wouldn't have a chance. But it's a throne of grace. You are on your way to hell. Mercy paid the price. Mercy paid the price. George felt like he had no reason to live, no reason to move on, but mercy loved him. And we obtained grace to help. In a time of need. Amen. Mercy. Mercy. People said mercy built a bridge between me and God. Well that bridge was a cross. Mercy. I know we get aggravated. God have mercy on Amy. (laughs) Well that came out pretty easy didn't it? I must have done that before. God have mercy. A wife to her husband. Angel, have mercy on Kim, Lord. Because if you don't, no. Have mercy. But I'm telling you what. 
Jesus had mercy on me. I obtained that. I obtained that. But I still find grace every time I approach my God. I still find grace. I still find grace. I still find grace. I still find grace. I still get heaven's help. People say, you make your bed, you lie in it. Yeah, that's all right. But mercy paid the price for me. And if I come to God, I still find grace. I still find grace to help me out. Amen. I still find grace to help me out. Hallelujah. I still find grace to help me out. Glory to God. I'm saved by through faith, not on my own, lest I should boast. It is the gift of God. (laughs) Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. So in life, you can be at peace. You can relax. Let's go to you at Mark 6, verse 45. Verse 45. I feel like I need to pray a minute. Just bow your head. Just bow your head. I'm so moved with compassion right now. Either someone here or someone streaming. There's a way out. There's a way out of your situation. There's a way out of your situation right now. There's a way out of your situation. And if you just surrender that to God right now, you just surrender that to God right now. He's merciful. He's merciful. Grace is waiting. Grace is there. Grace is there to pull you out. All you got to do is say, forgive me, God. Forgive me. I repent. I repent. Then he says back to you right now, I find no fault in you now. I find zero fault in you. I find zero fault in you. I find no fault in you, son. I find no fault in you, daughter. I find no fault in you. But I deserve. I deserve to be beat. I deserve. Yeah, but I find no fault in you. I I redeemed you. Now approach me and find my grace to help you in your time of need. In the name of Jesus, I command this word to separate them from that. From that in Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Wow. Amen. Verse 45. Immediately he Jesus made his disciples get into a boat. And to go to the other side. Before him. To the other side. And to a town called Bethsaida. While he sent away the multitude. And when he had sent them away. He Jesus went into a mountain and prayed. This is right after he fed to 5,000. He fed to 5,000, which some say it could be as high as 30,000 because the the men and women, the households of people, it could have been as high as that. And and so he uh, fed them, the 5,000, with that miracle breaking fish and bread. And so when the evening was come, so he went to a mountain and prayed. He sent the people away. When the evening was come, The boat was in the middle of the sea, and Jesus was still on the land praying. He was still on the land praying. Then he saw them toiling. King James says toiling. Another one says straining. Straining. How many's ever strained in life? Life's become a struggle. It's become a strain. I've been there, folks. I've been there when life was a struggle. Life was a strain. Toiling became a way of life at one time. When I, when I paid my bills, before I bought gas and milk, I was $125 a month in the hole. Uh, I toiled. I finished sheetrock in the day. I finished sheetrock at night. I sold cookware at night. Went in and cooked meals and sold cookware, and I was still toiling, still straining. I could see the other side, but I couldn't get there. And, uh, and sometimes you feel like you're all alone. Now, these were professional people. They've crossed that lake of Gal- Sea of Galilee many times. What Jesus did not do when he saw them in this, in this windstorm, he did not stand there and say, oh, look at them. 
Look at them. Father, look at them out there. They don't even know what to do. They're starting to panic. They're, they're toiling. They're straining. And Let's just see how long we can last before we help them out. That's not God. As soon as he saw them, he had compassion. And you know what he did immediately? He went. He went. He went to them. He saw them straining, toiling, rowing. For the wind was contrary. The wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. Fear really got them. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. It said, And he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled and marveled. So he went to them. Now one, transla- one story says where they were on the boat, he saw them toiling and rowing. And it said he came to them walking on the water. John's gospel said as soon as he got in, immediately there's at the other side. I'll tell you what, there's something about getting him in your boat that gets you to the other side immediately. There's something about that. There's something about getting him there. You know what Jesus did not want? Them to struggle. He did not want them to toil. He did not want them to strain. And what we've been going through for these last several weeks and months, I've watched people toil. I've watched people strain. I've watched people struggle. I mean, this thing got crazy. We were at Sam's yesterday, and that back wall where they sell toilet paper and all of that stuff, it was bare empty. You would think this thing just happened. It was still bare empty. You can't find the Clorox wipes. You can't find sanit. I mean, you know, people are struggling to get by in some areas. But I want you to know in him, there's victory. In him, there's victory. In him, everything you need is in him. He is healing. He's victorious. He is God. Now, let me just quote this because I'm going to close up here. When you walk with him, you're going to have these benefits come your way. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There's benefits in him. You have benefits, and it's not struggle. What are they? Who forgives all of my iniquities. He does that. Who heals all of my diseases. Who crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies my mouth with good. Did I miss one? Which one? Oh, he redeems my life from destruction. He redeems my life from destruction. You know what redeeming? He bought you out of it. He redeems my life from destruction. He forgives. He heals. He satisfies. He redeems. He satisfies my mouth with good. Why? So my youth is renewed like the eagles. When my mouth is satisfied with good, it affects my natural strength. It affects me. Amen. So during all this time, you know what we've had available to us? A throne of grace. A throne of grace. A throne of grace. A throne of grace. I pretty much use the same text and almost preach a different message. This this one that I did the first one. It's really true. Uh, It's a throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. There's a different compassion about this this one. There's There's an urgency about this one. It's a throne of grace that you may obtain it and find grace to help in a time of need. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, I and everyone that's been born again has obtained mercy. We've all obtained it. We've all obtained it. But grace we find every time we approach God. I said we've all obtained mercy. But grace we find every time we approach God. We've all obtained mercy. But grace we find 
every time we approach God. Every day. Every day. It's, 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 it's available. You'll, you, you'll never go and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm out of grace. I'm out of grace. I'm out of grace. I'm sorry, Ken. Bill Falk used it all up yesterday. I said limit one, but he took it all. No. No. Tired of this limit one. <laughs> no, there's more than enough. There's more than enough for all of us. Would you bow your head with me? You that are streaming, you that are present right now, with your head bowed and your eyes closed. If you need to surrender your life to God, today I'm not going to have you come to the altar. I'm not going to have you march up here today. But if you surrender your life to God, if you're, if you're willing, and you know you need to, either you've walked with God, walked away from God, backslid, whatever the case may be, with your eyes closed and your heart bowed in reverence, I'm going to ask you right now, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand right where you're at. Just lift your hand. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just looking around here. This is an opportunity. It doesn't have to be done in the church, but it has to be done. It has to be done. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. I want you... You that raise your hand, I want you to pray with me. Say, Father, thank you for this opportunity. I thank you that I've obtained mercy. And I've found grace. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. By your blood. I surrender my life. And I accept you as my Lord now. For with my heart I believe, and with my mouth I confess, you are Lord. Amen. Today, if you need prayer, if you, got, you, need, you need healing your body, you need uh, anything touched physically, spiritually, financially, before we go, I want you to lift your hand. I'm going to pray over you right now. Anyone, any prayer? In the name of Jesus, Father, you see the hands. Most of all, you see the heart. I ask you right now, Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. You're moving on them right now. I decree in the name of Jesus. I decree in Jesus' name. Receive it now. Receive. Just speak it where you can hear it. I receive healing. I receive this deliverance. I, I receive this breakthrough. I receive it. In the name of Jesus, you receive it. You receive it. You receive it. You receive it. Hallelujah. 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 Say, the Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. You see why those verses mean a lot to me? Because I can approach Him now with, without a guilty heart. Without a guilty heart because it's good. Amen. When I close in a minute, this side can, can go out. And uh, work their way out, and then this side can work their way out, and then the middle section to be dismissed. Oh yeah, if you you that have prayed today, you that rededicated your life or surrender, tell someone today. The Bible said, "Confess me." Tell someone today to do that, and then don't forget your flower out there, and then the middle section, and the and the worship team will be playing while you're working your way out. Father, I thank you now in the name of Jesus. No sickness, no plague, no disaster, no destruction nor disease shall come near us. And because of the promise we have accessible through Psalms 91 that the angels would bear us up lest we dash our foot against a stone, we all say angels, Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus, be blessed today.